Yes. Well, good morning, everyone. I'd like to welcome you to the virtual Wind River Intertribal Gathering presented by the Eastern Shoshone and Northern Arapaho Tribes with support from the Greater Yellowstone Coalition and Yellowstone National Park. I'd also like to thank our generous sponsors at Native Organizers Alliance, National Parks Conservation Association, Wyoming Outdoor Council, and American Rivers. Like Just note that we are recording this event to share with others in the future. My name is Charles Wolf Drimmel. I'm the Deputy Director of Conservation with the Greater Yellowstone Coalition. The Greater Yellowstone Coalition works with people to protect the lands, waters, and wildlife of the 20 million acre Greater Yellowstone ecosystem. I'm joining you from Bozeman, Montana, which is the traditional homelands of many tribes, including Nitsitapi Blackfeet, Absalagay Crow, Salish, and Shoshone. Exactly 150 years ago to this day, on March 1st, 1872, President Ulysses S. Grant signed an act to create Yellowstone sure. National Park. This landmark legislation created America's first national park and an inspirational beacon for large landscape conservation for the world to follow. Okay. That story, unfortunately, overshadows another reality. Indigenous people have called this landscape home for millennia. The early creation of Yellowstone ignores Crow, Blackfeet, Bannock, and Nez Perce camps around Yellowstone Lake that have been there for generations. It disregards the rugged year-round residents of the sheep eater Shoshone on this landscape, and it hides the forced removal of Bannock by the U.S. military to make way for a public park. The truth is tribes have been intimately connected to this landscape for generations through hunting, gathering, fishing, ceremony, education, economics, medicine, waking and sleeping, and stewardship. Today's gathering is meant to commemorate the 150th anniversary of Yellowstone National Park and to elevate the indigenous connection to Yellowstone and America's public lands, a relationship that has existed since time immemorial. It's my honor to facilitate today's event. We're joined by tribal elders, tribal chairmen, tribal historic preservation officers, federal employees from the Park Service, Environmental Protection Agency, and non-governmental conservationists. We'll start the morning with the flag song and prayer followed by speakers. We'll then host two panels with a five minute break between each panel. The first panel will focus on tribal consultation and stewardship of public lands, waters, and wildlife. <clears throat> Second panel will focus on indigenous cultural connections to Yellowstone National Park and the greater Yellowstone ecosystem. Following each panel, we'll have the opportunity for questions and answers. If you have questions for the panelists, please place it in the chat and I will do my best to address those questions in the order that they're received. Our morning will wrap up with closing remarks and a prayer. I'd like to begin by introducing Eugene Ridgely, the drum keeper of the Northern Arapaho Eagle Drum to perform the Northern Arapaho Flag Song. They'll be followed by Arlen Shoyo, an Eastern Shoshone elder who will offer a prayer.
Thank you, Arlen. Now I'd like to introduce my colleague, Wes Martell, who's the senior Wind River Conservation Associate, the Greater Yellowstone Coalition in our Fort Washakie office. He's also a former 20 year member of the Eastern Shoshone Business Council. Wes will provide some context around the intertribal gathering and introduce successive speakers. Thank you, Wes. Wes, you're muted right now. Aho, aho, Arlen Shore, for his powerful word. I thank the color door. I take this time to recognize all of our veterans here and the name given to me by my Arapaho grandparents is Beacon Plume. So for all of you indigenous people out there, whatever your word is for Plume, that's me. Good morning, Native America. I am honored to participate in this important event commemorating the 150th anniversary of Yellowstone National Park. Since time immemorial, this part of the world known as Yellowstone has been a special and sacred place for at least 49 tribes, and to this day still holds high spiritual significance in our traditional use and gathering and in our ceremonies and lodges. A feeling of being blessed, thankful, and protected is what the indigenous people feel when at Yellowstone. That feeling allowed the natural law of reciprocity, you take care of us, we take care of you, to recognize and determine the relevance of all life to one another. We are all related to all that lives and grows, including the mountains, hills, and land. The water of life is a sacred gift that takes care of us. I remember Jackson Hole when it was a sleepy little western town that catered to skiers in winter and Yellowstone National Park visitors in summer. Now, when you go to that area, and if you believe money is what makes you rich, Yellowstone National Park is taking care of a lot of people from all over the world. How are all these people taking care of Yellowstone National Park? <clears throat> we cannot keep taking and expect things to remain the same. There is already imbalance. 
higher temperatures, less precipitation, and decreasing habitat. We are not taking care of that which takes care of us. Today, we will hear from a range of speakers who will share their experience and knowledge working through tribal and federal agencies to understand the true meaning of a government to government relationship that exists between tribes and the United States. There are critical aspects of this relationship, such as consultation, communication, and treaty based collaboration that will require policy changes and continuing dialogue. It is our intent that today's virtual event and the impact person gathering to be here on June 1st, 2nd, and 3rd will trigger awareness and motivation for tribal agencies and federal agencies to begin meaningful discussions, recognize the importance of conservation and the tribal ecological knowledge that acknowledges the natural law of reciprocity. When our ancestors signed treaties in 1863 and 1868, they were trying to protect the way of life. The colonizers' efforts to exterminate the buffalo was an attempt to exterminate us and this way of life. They almost succeeded and were not for the power and spirit of our relatives who walked this ground before us, we would not exist. That is what we want the world to know. We are still here. We are resilient and we take the spirit of our relative, the buffalo, to become stronger and protect what we have left. Some tribes no longer exist. There are birds, animals, and fish that no longer exist. Things are out of balance. Our hope is that we still have enough people out there who are grateful for the natural world and our connection to the gifts we are blessed with. That is our mission. We welcome you to be with us. And it gives me great pleasure to uh, announce our speakers for this morning. We have our two chairmen here from our tribes, and we have a superintendent from Yellowstone National Park and our executive director. And I'd like to turn it over to Chairman John St. Clair. Thank you very much. It's an honor to be here today to say a few words on this historic occasion, the 150th anniversary of the creation of Yellowstone Park. The Yellowstone Park Act of 1872 was signed into law by President Ulysses S. Grant, which reserved and withdrew it from settlement, occupation, and sale. It became a public park for the benefit and enjoyment of all the people. Historically, it had been a place where native and indigenous tribes utilized it as their traditional homeland and exercised their inherent rights to hunt, fish, and gather plants and roots used for food, healing, and ceremonial purposes. Just four years earlier, like Wes Martell said, Many tribes entered into treaties with the United States. They reserved the right to hunt on the unoccupied lands of the United States. Some of the tribes were the Eastern Shoshone, the Bannock, and Crow. Not only was the Yellowstone Act a breach of these treaties and the inherent rights of other tribes, it went further to make trespassers of all native people. As one of the original stewards of this continent, I, as a member of the Eastern Shoshone tribe, welcome and applaud the offer from Park Superintendent Cam H. Shawley to the tribes to have cultural, traditional, and historic who have cultural, traditional, and historic connections to the park to participate in the anniversary process. Joint Secretarial Order Number 4303, signed by the Honorable Deb Holland, Secretary of the Interior, and the Honorable Thomas J. Vilsack, Secretary of the Agriculture, recognizes the federal trust responsibility 
to tribes in the stewardship of federal lands and waters. The order seeks to protect treaty, religious, substance, and cultural interests. It states that co-stewardship and tribal stewardship will fulfill the trust and treaty obligations. The implementation of this order in the anniversary of Yellowstone Park is a positive step in the right direction. However, it is only a first step. I propose that in the future, the federal government consider only tribal, tribal stewardship rather than co-stewardship over all national parks. The tribes have, that have significant ties to these parks should manage them as they manage them historically. After all, we are the original stewards of this country. The parks would still remain open to the public as they are today. Since they are available and open to the public, Congress could appropriate sufficient funds necessary to carry out tribal management. This idea is not my original idea. I picked it up in an article from the Atlantic Magazine, May 2021 by David Truer. He also is the author of The Heartbeat of Wounded Knee, Native America from 1890 to the present. Thank you very much. Thank you, John. Chairman St. Clair for your remarks. I'd like to ask Chairman Drescher to offer his words this morning. Yeah, Kat. Thank you all for being a part of this today. I would like to first thank the Yellowstone Greater Coalition, including Wes Martell and his staff members, such as Holy Friday and Latera Lavo. Thank you all for being indigenous people and being passionate about this work as well. And thank you all for helping make this an event that something to remember. 150 years is a very long time, but if you think about it, Yellowstone has been here since the very beginning and multiple tribes have called it home at different times. And it's been a place where- At this time, all freshmen boys, please report to the library. All freshmen boys to the library. Thank you. 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 Sorry about that. Um, but overall, Yellowstone has been a place where it's attacked in so many ways more than one. And it's truly a place of the, of the West. And that's something that's always been the lore of the West is that it's kind of untouched. But with that said, I think it's very important that we recognize it as a place of indigenous importance. The name itself, it comes from the Yellowstone River, which is named after, a, which was given as a name by a tribe. So the, the historical ties go from, for it from the very beginning. And if you think about it, Yellowstone has been a place that has been regulated in so many ways than one. And us doing our part to make sure that it's, un, that it's untouched in both so many different ways and also protected is something that Native people can recognize as well. There's different acts that have been passed that have been really beneficial to it as well, including the Clean, Clean Air Act of 1970, the Clean Water Act of 1972, the Endangered Species Act of 1973, that goes in hand in hand with a lot of the stuff that tribal members have been fighting for in our communities as well. Tribal communities don't have clean water. Tribal communities don't have clean air. And those are things that we fight hand in hand also with the park services. So as a country, as a nation, I think we can come together and we can agree that not only do we need to take care of these national parks, but also we need to take care of our tribal communities as well. And that's something that we strive for every day. And, but it's something that all of us can do every day. All of us can make smart choices every day to make sure that this earth is here for future generations. Plastic is something that's very um, accessible, but also it's not as recyclable in, in many ways as we think. Plastic bags is one thing that clogs up the different machines, so it's not as recyclable as some people think. So there's little things that we can do, including using reusable, reusable bags when you go grocery shopping. Um, trying to do those different things like that matter in the long run. And not only will that help our community to grow and prosper, but also remain untouched for future generations. So I think that 
this event, 150 years, has the benefit to spark a lot of conversations, whether it be here in the Wyoming Indian, in the classrooms, and also in the universities, but also across the world, where we can talk about what we can do to make sure that this earth is untouched. So those are just some of the acts that I mentioned earlier, and also the, some of the things that we can do every day. So I want to thank all of us for having these conversations and hopefully making not only this event a good one to, and also to remember, but also one where we can spark important conversations about what we can do to protect this earth. So I thank you all for joining us today. Thank you, Chairman Dresser, for those good words. And our next speaker is the Superintendent of Yellowstone National Park, Cam Charlie. And we're very grateful to have the superintendent join us here today. So I'll we'll turn it directly over to you, Mr. Shelley. Well, thank you, Wes, and both of the, both of the chairmen. Uh, we're inspired by you all. <clears throat> and I can't thank you enough and the sponsors, uh, you know, like GYC and NPCA and others for hosting this. And, and Wes, when you, when you mentioned this was coming together last year, uh, we're very excited about it. Uh, I'm glad that we're going to be able to get together. I hope we can get together face to face in early June. Uh, but I really appreciate the tribes uh, putting this, this virtual session together and us kind of having uh, 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 Chairman um, St. Clair talked about kind of a first step conversation around what the future looks like. And I think uh, this is the perfect point in time for us to have those conversations. You know, the 150th uh, is a milestone. It's, uh, it's something that as Americans, we can be proud of in many ways. But it's also a point in time that we need to reflect on the lessons of the past and in many ways, some of the mistakes of the past. And so I feel like the, the timing is perfect for us to uh, open this dialogue and, and have constructive conversations around what the future holds and what is possible uh, for us to work on together uh, moving forward. Uh, I, I don't need to tell any of you that uh, there are currently 27, uh, at least 27 affiliated tribes with the Yellowstone area, um, dating back over 10,000 years uh, in this area and the absolute importance that uh, we take this point in time to, to, to really reflect on not only what we've done right and wrong over the last 150 years, but to really uh, focus on on prior to Yellowstone. And we've made that a, a, a big part of this 150th anniversary is, is opening uh, partnerships and dialogue with tribes. And I've been, and the team here has been uh, so, so engaged with so many partners and, and so many tribal nations and ideas about the future. I think the question is, how do we develop and turn those into concrete actions for the future? And I think that's, it's, it's as you know, uh, sometimes easy to talk about doing things and much harder to get organized and actually do them. I think the thing that you're seeing already transpire is momentum from many tribal nations to come together and put together some of those actions that are gonna be very, very important uh, for the next 150 years. And so if we reflect on, on just the past uh, since 1872, uh, we didn't get it right uh, for the first 90 to 100 years. In fact, we got a lot of things wrong. Uh, I don't, um, I don't, I think if you look at uh, just 100 years ago, uh, you know, the gov US government extirpated uh, most of the predators in this park killed all the wolves, killed all the mountain lions, um, significantly reduced uh, grizzly populations, uh, you know, reduced bison from tens of thousands to less than 25 animals. In the 1960s, we were feeding grizzly bears out of garbage dumps so visitors could see them. Uh, and to, to Chairman Dresser's point, uh, in the 60s and 70s, for a variety of different reasons, uh, we started to get more serious about what wildlife conservation and, and protection of this place uh, meant. 
and what we needed to do to put the pieces back together of this ecosystem. And we've largely succeeded at recovering from some of those major mistakes early on in, uh, in Yellowstone's history. Uh, we started this season with 123 wolves in the Yellowstone wolf population. Um, bison numbers are at or higher levels than they have been since Yellowstone became a park in 1872. Same with grizzly numbers. Mountain lions are back. Uh, you know, ungulate populations are back in balance like elk uh, and deer. Um, and so we can be proud of some of that progress, even though uh, in general, it was a recovery from mistakes that we'd made early in the century. One of the things that's really important though, is the cultural significance of Yellowstone to so many tribes. And while we've had good relationships and initiatives uh, with many tribal nations over the decades, uh, we haven't done everything that we should do in relationship to working together and ensuring that tribes are involved with uh, stewarding these lands, communicating and educating uh, the many millions of visitors that come here every year on the importance of tribal heritage and culture. And that is something that we're very interested in focusing on the future. I think it's also important that while, you know, the Yellowstone ecosystem uh, is health-wise in better condition now than it has been since Yellowstone became a park, that's a very fragile state. And there are very uh, many contemporary threats and challenges that can uh, affect the condition of this ecosystem. Uh, climate change is one of the major ones. Uh, you know, we're, we're, we're seeing um, more and more invasive species entering the park. Uh, we had some of the lowest and warmest water temperatures uh, and water levels uh, since the 1930s last year, affecting our fisheries. Uh, wildfires uh, starting much, much earlier in the year, burning longer into the year. Uh, and those are real challenges that not only Yellowstone faces, but many parks face across the system. And we need to work together to figure out how are we going to uh, help species adapt to uh, changing climates in the future. Uh, there is modeling out there that suggests that Yellowstone's um, climate uh, midway through the century will be similar to what we see today in Northern Utah. And that by the end of this century, the climate in Yellowstone will be similar to what we see today in Southern Utah. And so that presents a, a whole range of major challenges. Uh, many of you felt followed the, the non-native lake trout uh, issue in Yellowstone Lake. And, you know, likely introduced by humans, we call bucket biologists back in the 80s. Uh, lake trout predate on cutthroat, the native cutthroat trout. Uh, we, we, we started seeing lake trout in the 80s and 90s in Yellowstone Lake. Uh, we started to work on eradicating lake trout slowly uh, in the 90s and into the 2000s. But we almost let uh, one of the most important keystone native species, the cutthroat trout, blink out in the 2000s. And it's a reminder that uh, as far as we think we've come, that these threats are, are very present and that we cannot relax and we must be as proactive as possible when we see threats to the ecosystem coming. And thanks to well over $10 million of investment and probably another five to $7 million needed in the future, uh, the cutthroats are recovering and the lake trout numbers are declining. Uh, but like I said, that is something that we've all got to be cognizant of as we work together uh, to protect this ecosystem into the future. For the 150th for this year, uh, I'm excited about many of the things that we were talking about and working on. Um, the Tribal Heritage Center at Old Faithful. Uh, we want to make sure that the things that we try this year with you um, are sustainable. 
and not just a 150th thing, but the start of something that can happen and build over the long term. And so we're excited to host multiple tribal nations uh, to come to the Tribal Heritage Center here in Yellowstone and see where that can go. Uh, the multi-tribal TP village in August at the north entrance near the Roosevelt Arch. Uh, I think that's gonna be extremely important, both of those, the Heritage Center and the TP village, for visitors to come here and not just listen to the Park Service talking about tribes and, and tribal heritage and culture, but no one can talk about culture and heritage like the tribes themselves. And so we want to see the tribes in the park with us uh, and directly engaging um, the visitation that comes through this park and enjoys this park every year. And we're excited about that. Uh, we've got many other things that we're working on um, that uh, we're adding to that list every day. I encourage uh, through this conversation today and the future conversations that we have, that we we be willing to try things out. Uh, if they don't work, we can always uh, you know change, make changes, or do something different. But let's really take advantage of 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 our time together to see what is possible and see what we can build toward and, and sustain in the future. And I, I know we can have a, a lot of conversations around what that means and what roles uh, different tribes play and, and how, how that interface with the National Park Service goes. But we want you to know that we're here as, as your partner. Uh, we are here and very cognizant of uh, you being in this area and your ancestors uh, long, long before uh, Yellowstone became a park, before the creation of the National Park Service. And it's important for us to recognize that and embrace that in a, in a, in a much stronger and better fashion. And so um, thank you again for everything that you're doing. Wes, your leadership and friendship means a lot to me personally and to the staff here. Uh, we look forward to the rest of this session and we look really forward to coming down and interacting face-to-face -face, uh, in June with you all. Thank you very much. Indigenous persons. I'd like to call on our executive director for the Greater Yellowstone Coalition, Scott. I will turn it over to you. Great. Thanks, Wes. Um, it's great to see everybody, at least virtually this morning. Um, my name is Scott Christensen. I'm the executive director of the Greater Yellowstone Coalition. Uh, I'm based here in Bozeman, Montana, where our headquarters is. Um, mm -hmm which is my colleague Charles mentioned earlier today is uh, of course the ancestral homeland of the Absalica Crow, Shoshone, Bannock, Blackfeet, um, Arapaho, many other tribes. Um, it, I'm grateful to be a part of this this morning and I appreciate everybody uh, bearing with us through some of the audio or other technical difficulties and especially appreciative of our staff and the many people who are helping to put this together. Um, after the last couple of years of living life through Zoom, I don't know about you, but I'm very excited to um, start to see people in person again once, once things um, become safe to do so. And I'll put in another plug for uh, what we're aiming for in early June for an in-person uh, intertribal gathering down at, down at Wind River uh, to further commemorate, um, celebrate, and envision the future. Uh, here in this region with the tribal community. Um, I want to just tell you uh, for a moment a little bit about the Greater Yellowstone Coalition, um, who we are, what we do, and, and the importance of working with tribes in our work. Um, we were founded in 1983 uh, as a regional conservation organization um, with the mission of uh, protecting and conserving uh, this amazing landscape, what is today known as Greater Yellowstone. Um, that includes the lands, waters, and wildlife of, of this place. Uh, and of course, the human communities that are a component of it as well. Um, we operate from offices here in Bozeman, Montana, Driggs, Idaho, uh, Jackson, Lander, and Cody, Wyoming, and a new office uh, at Fort Washakie, uh, which is staffed by my great colleagues, Wes Martell, uh, Latera LeBeau, and, and Colleen Friday. 
Um, our work really centers on land conservation and connectivity, wildlife conservation, uh, climate change and water issues, and, and a new area of work, uh, a long overdue area of work for us, tribal conservation priorities and partnerships. Um, that's a new commitment that we're serious about um, at our organization. Um, and as we celebrate um, the 150th of Yellowstone, we both want to honor the past and, and recognize it. Also uh, be clear eyed about the present and where we are today. And then of course, together envision the future and, and what we can uh, accomplish working together with the park service and leaders like Pam, with the tribal communities and, and all the different um, people involved who at the end of the day care deeply about this place. And, and that's one of the things that I find most rewarding about um, uh, my job is to interact with people who care, who are passionate about this place uh, for all sorts of different reasons. It clearly has deep meaning for me uh, and all of you. Uh, and it's great to see that there are uh, almost 350 people uh, this morning tuned in from uh, all across the country and maybe beyond that. Um, as others have said, Yellowstone is a remarkable place uh, and important to many people, including uh, indigenous people. And yet there's a tension. Uh, Charles spoke to this, Cam mentioned it. Um, uh, uh, there is, uh, and the tribal chairman as well, there's a tension here uh, between the creation of national parks and what uh, came along with uh, the, the designation of those lands. And, and that was the, the removal of indigenous people. That's something we need to acknowledge uh, and recognize. Uh, and as Wes said earlier, recognize the fact that uh, the people, those people are still here today. Um, and, uh, and together, I hope that we can envision a future uh, where, uh, we do talk about these things, but we move beyond conversation to action about what we can do in the future to um, ensure that all the voices, the right voices are at the table uh, and are given proper weight consideration. Um, we, uh, part of what we do at the Greater Yellowstone Coalition is to bring people together, just like in this setting, um, uh, we want to convene people for the important conversations that need to happen that will uh, shape the future of this place, of its land, waters, wildlife, and people. Um, we think about this region as Yellowstone at the core, the heart of a, a large um, uh, ecosystem, but there are you know, 20 million acres around uh, that park uh, that are important to the future of that park and to the people who care about this place. One of those places is Wind River. Um, the Wind River Reservation is the size of Yellowstone and of course an integral part of this ecosystem and, and stewarded by the two tribes, Eastern Shoshone and Northern Arapaho. Um, it's an honor for me to partner with those two tribes uh, and others. Um, uh, as I said, we're committed to this work, um, opening an office at Fort Washakie and hiring staff to help lead, guide, and direct this work is part of that commitment. Um, if you haven't had a chance to reach out and meet Wes, um, Latera, or Colleen, please do so. Um, I, uh, I'm just thrilled about uh, them joining our team um, and helping to lead this work which really encapsulates you know, a, a landscape much larger, larger than Yellowstone and even larger than the 20 million acre greater Yellowstone region. There are tribes that are connected to this place all across this country and continent. Uh, and as Wes and others have more conversations with tribes in the Midwest and the Pacific um, Northwest and the Southwest, uh, we're learning about more and more about those connections to Yellowstone. You know, obsidian from obsidian cliff inside the park has been found all across this continent, demonstrating the reach uh, and importance of this place. Um, I want to share with you briefly a couple of the uh, areas of work that we are, are engaged in right now. We've partnered with uh, Yellowstone National Park. Uh, 
uh, Yellowstone Forever and, and many different tribes that are part of the Intertribal Buffalo Council to try and reduce the slaughter of Yellowstone's bison and, um, and get those bison out of the park alive and to tribal lands all across this country. Part of that involved uh, jointly raising a million dollars this last year to expand the facility in Yellowstone where, where those animals can be captured and go through a process that, um, that, be, that begins to uh, open possibilities for them to uh, be um, returned to tribal lands. I think of this as not only the ecological restoration of the species, but the cultural restoration of them as well. And, Tribal leaders like Jason Baldus and others um, are, are, key, uh, are key people and leaders in that effort. Um, we're also uh, very committed to restoring and protecting water resources, uh, both on Wind River and beyond that. Um, but acknowledging, recognizing that water is life um, and is a critical component of this region, which we really view as the headwaters of the West. Um, that we need to do more together to protect our water resources. That means keeping water in streams, um, restoring fisheries, uh, species like beaver that have been removed and, and trying to get back to uh, uh, a place where those wa watersheds are healthy and providing all the benefits to us and, and nature that, um, that they need to. Another piece is, is looking at what we can do to repatriate some of the lands that have been taken from native people, um, parts of reservations that have been lost um, over time. We're very interested in exploring what we can do um, to support those efforts. And we see those as very much tri tribal led um, and uh, with support by us and many others. Um, and finally, I just want to express a commitment to learning and listening and understanding how we can be an effective partner. Um, we have a lot to learn um, and, and we look to many of you participating today in this effort and, and in the future events this year to celebrate the Yellowstone's 150th. This is a learning opportunity for us. Um, we're committed to learning, listening, and doing things differently in the future. Um, thank you for speaking up and using your voice. Um, my door is always open. You can, I hope you think of our organization as one that is willing to listen and to learn uh, and to partner and work together. Um, one of the things, as I mentioned, that we are learning that Wes has helped us with is he's begun to reach out to tribes really across the country to talk about Yellowstone's 150th uh, is, is just the connections across this, this continent to Yellowstone. I wanna share with you a quick map that illustrates uh, uh, at least in part some of those connections. This is a, a new map that, um, uh, that was just put together by one of our board members, Avi Devon. Um, with help from Wes and our staff down at Wind River. I'm gonna attempt here to share my screen well, real quick, um, just briefly. Can people see that? Um, you know, this is of course just a snapshot uh, of, of the native communities in relation to Yellowstone National Park. Um, but there are almost 50 different tribes who have expressed a connection uh, to this region and to the park. Um, that, that, that's a lot of people um, with a lot of interests and, and deep, deep, deep connections. Um, I, I, um, I'm constantly uh, amazed by the, the power of Yellowstone and the power of this place. Um, and I think this map in some small way illustrates um, that. So with that, I, I wanna say thank you uh, to the participants today on the program and those of you who are tuning in. Um, I'll echo um, Chairman Dresser's remarks in saying that we all have a part in this. Um, conservation doesn't happen without people um, and beyond conservation, 
recognizing the importance of places like Yellowstone uh, and, and the connections that we all and Native people have to, it doesn't happen without a group effort. So I'm appreciative again of all those uh, who have participated today and will throughout this year and beyond. Um, we have much work to do uh, and I'm excited to do that with all of you. With that, I'll, I think I'll turn it back over to either Wes or Charles. Thank you. Thank you for the comments, Scott. And we're very thankful for your leadership and the board's leadership. And the comments that we have heard are all important as we move forward and to determine how we as indigenous people are going to be included in, in, in the management of public lands and national parks. Our next panel is a tribal consultation and coordination the stewardship of federal lands, waters, and wildlife. We have several federal representatives who will be joining us for, the, for this panel. We have the um, some tribal historic preservation offers to join us. We also have some elders that are going to be joining us here as we discuss the indigenous connection to Yellowstone National Park. Dorothy Firecloud is a member of the National Park Service, and she is also the liaison to National Park Service Director Charles Sams. She began this position on October 1st of 2010. Dorothy brings 28 years of experience in the important and diverse topics of tribal relations and supporting the department's policy on consultation with Indian tribes. Her office provides guidance and support to tribes, to MBS field and program managers to strengthen relationships with Native American, Alaska Native, Native Hawaiian, and other indigenous communities. Dorothy is a member of the Rosebud Sioux Tribe. She has a Juris Doctorate from the New Mexico School of Law and has been a member of the New Mexico State Bar since 1991. And I will turn it over to you, Dorothy, and thank you for being here. Okay, thank you, um, Wes. It's good to be here with everyone today. And I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen and go through some of the um, um, events that are happening within and the new laws that are going on within the Department of Interior as well as the National Park Service. So let me... <clears throat> I can do this now, hopefully. Oops, okay, there we go. <laughs> Thanks for, um, um, the superintendent had shared this photo with me a number of months back and I just thought it was really beautiful and um, just really incorporates everything which, which is so powerful about Yellowstone and the place that it is. So. Dorothy, this is Charles, we can't see your screen yet. Oh no? Okay, yet. all right, let me. Try it again. Thank okay. You. All right. Let me try it again. Otherwise, I might have to. Let's see. Okay. Now, can you see anything? You see? Do you see my screen there? Yes, we do. Okay. Oh, good. Okay. So anyway, let me go back to the photo just so that you can see it. And this is the um, photo that Cam had shared with me last fall, and it's just such a gorgeous picture. Um, and really hoping, I uh, believe both the new NPS director and myself will be out there this coming August. So, okay, oops, hopefully. Okay, so um, as everyone is aware, we now have a National Park Service director, which we haven't had for six years. And we're very fortunate to have as the 19th National Park Service director, Charles Chuck Sams, who's a member of the Umatilla tribe. And um, he came on board like um, early December. And so he's just now getting started with a lot of the different things that he's focusing on. So um, as he's going along, he's having us do quite a few things. And one of the first things that I am responsible, responsible for is, within the National Park Service is to be the tribal consultation officer. And as you're all aware, as soon as Biden was put into office, he had issued the presidential memorandum on tribal consultation. And um, we held four large sessions within the Department of Interior in early March. 
And as a result of that, we were able to get the report back to OMB. And right now what we're working on is updating the Department of Interior Tribal Consultation Policy. And we were hoping to have that done by the end of this month. And so we have um, the consultation policy itself will have an actual implementation guidance as well as two addendums to the um, consultation policy, one that's specific with um, consulting with um, Native Hawaiian organizations and another that's specific to consulting with Alaska Native corporations. And um, <clears throat> one of the things that the new um, Director Sams had discussed with me was the fact that the National Park Service has never ever had an internal National Park Service consultation policy. So it, um, he gave me directions to go ahead and get one done. So right now I'm forming the work group. We'll have three, um, four tribal or four members who are with um, federal employees, three that are National Park Service employees, one that is US Forest Service employee, and then we'll have three um, tribal members who will be sitting on that work group and developing the consultation policy. And um, the uh, Director Sam has said that he wants it done in director's order form and that he wants it completed by the end of fiscal year 22. So um, the other thing that, oops, sorry, I keep hitting the wrong button. The um, other thing that, that we do as tribal consultation officers within each of the federal agencies is that we have to report to the Secretary of Interior by the end of um, each calendar year, all of the tribal consultations that have occurred within the National Park Service. And unfortunately, we're a little behind on that and we haven't done one for the last two years because of COVID and especially with um, 2020 being um, kind of the time that a lot of the tribes were having more issues and not able to consult as often as possible. So we're working on that and hopefully we'll get that out within the next month. <clears throat> but in Biden issuing his January 26, 2021 presidential memorandum was only the beginning of what's um, been coming forward. So the first one of the other things that he did right away was to establish the White House Council on Native American Affairs. And currently four of the committees have heavy involvement from within the National Park Service. And um, I'll go through those on, on this next slide. Uh, <clears throat> as Chairman St. Clair had mentioned, one of the main things that we're really focused on right now is Secretarial Order 3403, which is a joint secretarial order between USDA and the Department of Interior on fulfilling the trust responsibility to Indian tribes when it comes to the stewardship of federal lands and water. Right now, there's a group of us within the National Park Service who have been writing policy memorandum for the Park Service when it comes to the secretarial order. And um, we have the policy memorandum almost complete and hope to have it in, um, in position by the end of this month and get that out to the tribes to see um, what it is that we're doing. It, we were really truly amazed by the number of policies that we have internally that had already been doing a lot of this stuff. So I was glad to report on that. Um, one of the second things that came out from the Office of Science and Technology Policy was the Indigenous Traditional Ecological Knowledge and Federal Decision Making. And a lot, you'll notice that a lot of these were all issued right about the time of the Tribal Summit last year and given to the tribal leaders who participated in that. And um, the Park Service had a Director's Order 100 that was um, that was signed right at the very end of the Obama um, administration. And it was something that the tribes were really happy to see because of the inclusion of traditional knowledge throughout the stewardship into the 21st century. And unfortunately, um, Director's Order 100 was rescinded in August of the next year. And um, <clears throat> at the moment, we're taking a look at that to see if we'll um, bring it back the way that it was, if we'll bring it back stronger because of all the secretarial orders and the new direction that the current administration is um, working on. So um, yeah, be looking forward to that. One of the other things that, um, that's also been done is there's a new um, MOU that's been signed by quite a few agencies on the protection of indigenous sacred sites. And this is one that the Park Service is actively participating in. And um, there's actually gonna be a listening session on this on uh, March 9th 
beginning at one o'clock from one o'clock to 4.30 p.m. And um, if you go to the Department of Interior Tribal Consultation webpage, you'll be able to get the information. I don't think it's up yet, but I'd say by the end of this week, the information on that will be up. And what that's um, being held for is within the uh, memorandum of understanding, it says that we have to report back within you know, to hold the meeting within 90 days. And so we're able to then do that um, listening session. Um, and then this um, second memorandum of understanding is on protecting um, tribal treaty and reserved rights. One of the biggest things that's coming out of this um, on kind of a quicker um, time track is a tribal treaties database, which is being done through the University of Oklahoma School of Law. And um, it'll have the Kapler um, treaty books that would be on there. And so people will have a, a quick access to all treaties and um, take a look at that. There's also the new executive order on um, missing and murdered indigenous peoples. And even though the National Park Service isn't as actively involved in this work group, um, we will be training our law enforcement officers and many more of our front, um, front um, the park rangers that are, that are at our gates and are um, working with the um, public much more in order for them to be able to identify different, um, you know, like if they can, um, maybe notice that a woman is um, being kidnapped or something like that, because there's quite a, you know, millions and millions of people that come through our gates every year. And unfortunately, there's quite a bit of domestic violence and other um, such activities that happen within park boundaries. There's also the secretarial order memorandum on the Federal Indian Boarding School Initiative. And there's a report that's due to Secretary Holland on April 1st. And I think we'll get that to her within the next probably three weeks. And we've been fairly heavily involved in this at the very beginning because the, the initial report that's due to her is gonna talk about 12 of the different federal boarding schools that Indian boarding schools that were out there. And 10 of those 12 boarding schools are um, designated um, as national historic landmarks. And because of that, the National Park Service had quite a bit of information on each one of those um, boarding schools. So what we were able to do was to hand over the links to all of that information to the work group that's working on this. And so they were able to not have to go back and redo a lot of that kinds of research. And so we were fortunate enough to be involved um, by helping with that. One of the um, last two secretarials that came, came out recently was Secretarial Order 3404, <clears throat> which um, declared, um, you know, the derogatory term towards Native American women, and as well as implementing procedures to remove that term from federal usage. And so right now, we have one member from the National Park Service that's working on that work group. They're going through and identifying all the different places throughout the United States that have used this term. Um, I had actually started looking into this a couple of years ago because, well, today I'm um, sitting within the um, um, exterior boundaries of the Yavapai Apache Nation in Camp Verde, Arizona. And I, um, this is where home is for me right now because I had formerly been the superintendent at um, Montezuma Castle before I took this position. And the, the huge mountain that's outside my door at my house here in town is um, unfortunately uses that. So I had begun talking to um, Mr. Randall, who's the Apache, um, um, elder here and looking at different terms. And it was one of the things I was gonna start working on once I retire here in a couple of years was to look at the, um, how we could change that name. And um, so I think the Forest Service met with Mr. Randall last week and the um, Apache word for this is where the porcupine sun themselves. So it's gonna, um, the new name will have something to do with that. And so, you know, um, this one though is specific to internal where Secretary Order 3405, which is regarding addressing derogatory geographic names aside from the derogatory word for Native American women in 3404. And this is one that the National Park Service is actually taking the lead on. At the moment, um, we're um, developing a FACA reconciliation committee 
um, which will recommend to the secretary changes to existing federal land um, unit names and additional terms that may be considered derogatory. And yes, um, or actually on um, last Friday, the 24th, was the day that everybody had to have their um, applications in. And so um, this was put in the federal register on January 10th with all of the different things that are gonna be coming out of this. And Joshua Wilkins within the National Park Service will be taking the lead on this. And so um, he's been working closely with a few of us within the National Park Service um, to look at the different people that have applied and to make sure that we have a real good um, involvement from the um, Native American community as well as other um, indigenous populations. One of the last things that I want to talk about today is how critical it is for those tribes that have the ability to do self-governance contracting to work within the National Park Service. Currently we have four annual funding agreements and um, one is Grand Portage National Monument which is in northern Minnesota and the enabling legislation within Grand Portage has complete co-management of the monument. And so the vast majority of funding that you see below that we've had um, to date over $38 million that has been um, uh, gone into tribal communities and into their economy. And um, Grand Portage, I think has the vast majority of, of that as well as the fact that they have the vast, the vast majority of their staffing is um, Minnesota Chippewa tribal members. <clears throat> River Raisin National Battlefield Park in Michigan. This is one that was kind of, uh, um, when people think about different things that tribes can work with, they don't really think of battlefields unless it's um, like Little Bighorn or something like that. But River Raisin is in Michigan and it, had quite, it has quite a story to it. And right now they're working with their um, affiliated tribes to do a historical study. And hopefully through that historical study, then they'll be able to change the way that interpretation is done at, at the park. <clears throat> Via Calderas entered into a um, annual funding agreement. And the way that we do these is we do them initially for five years, but every year um, the dollar amount is renegotiated for the projects that will be done the following year. And um, Baya Calderas first entered into the agreement in fiscal year 19 with San Clara Pueblo in um, New Mexico. And so the last two years, they've been working on like a lot of road improvements in, um, within the park. Um, the last one is Redwood National Park in California. And this one is really a cool, um, they have quite a number of projects that go on every year. A lot of like trail maintenance, um, as you're aware, Redwood is on the coast of, in California, so there's quite a bit of erosion that goes on every year within the trails that are along the coastal area there. And um, the tribe has worked really hard with the park in order to establish a youth program. So all of the work that's done there in Redwood National Park is with Yurok tribal youth. And so, you know, one of the things that I would really like for tribal um, tribes to think about is how they can enter into these annual funding agreements. Every year in February, there's a federal register notice that comes out and it's um, entitled non-BIA bureaus when it comes to self-governance. And so um, <clears throat> take a look at that within the National Park Service, it lists all the different programs that tribes can work with. And there's, I think, over 30 different programs that um, we can enter into agreements um, through the self-governance authority. And Scott Aiken, who is the tribal liaison for U.S. Fish and Wildlife, and to myself are, are getting ready to um, be on the rulemaking committee for the Progress Act, which is um, some amendments for the self-governance act that was passed right at the end of fiscal year 21 or no, 20. And um, so the, um, the um, work group has been put together, but we haven't had our first meeting yet. And so I think that will happen shortly. Okay, so, and, and so that's my presentation for today. So thank you. Dorothy, thank you yeah. for, for those good words. Thank you, Dorothy. All right, let me stop sharing my screen here, figure out. We wanna move forward? With our yeah, let me. next speaker. And I also 
want to acknowledge that we want to thank the Wyoming Indian School District for allowing us to use their facilities here today. Just let me make a couple of Kimberly Garlick is an Eastern Shoshone tribal man and is currently the Tribal Affairs Brand with US EPA's Region 8 office in Denver. Kimberly has previously served as the Attorney General for the Eastern Shoshone Tribe for over seven years and is University of Denver College of Law alumni. In her current role, Kimberly advises regional leadership and staff in all facets of regional and national agency tribal policy consultation and capacity building for their work with 28 tribal nations. As Attorney General, Kimberly provided tribal government legal representation, which included jurisdictional and civil litigation, tribal law and policy development, transactional administrative law issues, and tribal enterprise representation. Kimberly is a former chair and commissioner with the Denver American Indian Commission. She currently lives in Denver, Colorado and spends time with friends and family at Fort Washkie, Wyoming and throughout the Rocky Mountain region. And it's my privilege to introduce Kimberly. Thank you. Good morning, Wes. Good morning, all of the participants. Thank you again to the Yellowstone Coalition uh, for the invitation to speak with you today as well as uh, thank you to Chairman, Chairman St. Clair, Chairman Dresser, and to, I believe, former Chairwoman uh, Shelly Fiant may be joining us as well. Um, we really appreciate the opportunity to speak with you, to talk to you about the work that we do in terms of consulting and building relationships with our tribal nations that we work with. Um, again, I'm Kimberly Barlick. I'm the Tribal Affairs Branch Chief with EPA Region 8 in our, in our Denver office. It's the regional office that covers uh, the Dakotas, Montana, Wyoming, Colorado, and Utah, and we work with the 28 tribal nations in, in that region. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen as well and get my PowerPoint going for you. Hopefully you can see this. Give me just a second. Hopefully you'll be able to see that. Um, in terms of the work that we do with our tribal nations and with our tribal partners, I really appreciate uh, Dorothy's um, conversations and in, in her um, presentation regarding a lot of the current activities that we have um, as federal governments and, and agencies. And, and it's great to hear about all of the various efforts that are happening, uh, both internally with her division as well as nationally. And I do want to start just sort of with a similar um, basis in, in terms of how we work and build our relationships with our tribal nations. Uh, this, again, is just a reminder for us of the foundation of those relationships. We build these consultation policies and coordination and collaborative efforts on number one, starting out with our federal government to government trust responsibility and our government relationship that we have with our various tribal nations um, across the board. And that's the time immemorial responsibility from the federal government. From the EPA's perspective, we have a foundation of policies that we have that have led us to where we are today. Uh, we currently have our consultation and coordination in Indian tribal governments policy um, that was established in 2011. Uh, we have done a couple of um, updates since that time, including a 2016 uh, guidance document regarding consultation and coordination and discussing treaty rights. And again, all of those efforts and these foundational pieces get us to where we are currently and some of the current efforts that are working in terms of tribal nation and tribal um, coordination. Um, when we start talking about consultation and we start talking about how do we help uh, be effective partners, how do we help uh, establish those relationships with tribes when the interests impact some of either either on reservation issues, tribal interests or other treaty rights and, and those types of things, 
we look to the policies to help be those guiding, guiding documents to be the um, foundational points. Um, as far as some of the current efforts that we're working on, again, Dorothy mentioned and referenced the January uh, 26, 2021 executive memorandum. This really set the foundation for the current administration for all agencies and directives to come back, reevaluate not only your existing policies, but make sure that what you're doing is enhancing your relationship with tribal governments. There is a stressor to uh, recognize again. Um, and I shouldn't say a stressor, but this is one of the emphasis points, continuing to recognize tribal sovereignty and self-governance um, and continuing commitments to recognize and enhance our federal trust responsibility. Those pieces work in terms of how we engage with our tribal governments and issues that we work on with you, with tribal partners, with our stakeholders, um, other stakeholders, and in terms of decision-making that EPA may have to make uh, for some of the areas where we have those primacy decisions and determinations. Uh, since January 26th, as Dorothy mentioned, uh, after that executive memorandum, EPA also engaged in a series of tribal consultation efforts. Uh, there was a work group established to review the current consultation policy, as well as look at the policy in conjunction with those comments, with that tribal participation, and to understand some of the needs and concerns that we have and that our tribal partners have with the work that we're doing as far as consultation goes and how we're coordinating our efforts. Um, with that recommendation and work group, we are currently working through and anticipate making those recommendations to enhance those policies. And um, again, combining and making sure that we're complying with the OMB directives. Um, we're, we're continuing to make that effort and plan to move that forward. Um, so what does that mean? What does that mean for, for you all, for us? It means that there are going to be continued opportunities to, to be involved in how the agencies engage with our tribal partners in certain areas, in, in areas if it's water quality permit issues, if it's regulatory issues, uh, rulemaking, those types of things. We want to have the tribal voice come in. We want to have that meaningful engagement and really understand the impacts that some of these decisions that agency is making has on our tribal partners. And one of the key pieces, and we'll get to this, um, is gonna be some of the evaluation, enhanced evaluation of treaty rights and, and really understanding how the agency impacts may, um, how, how that may impact any of the, the concerns and tribal interests, whether that's on or off the reservation. So those are some of the current activities and responses that EPA has done as far as the Biden administration or the executive memorandum that came out. Uh, I also wanna just emphasize that in November during the White House Council, the Tribal uh, Leaders Summit, our EPA administrator, um, Michael Regan, he signed also the memorandum of understanding regarding the interagency coordination and collaboration for the protection of tribal treaty rights and reserved rights. What again, what does that mean? It means we are gonna to continue to consider and commit to considering how our, our decision-making, our actions um, impact treaty or reserved rights, and especially in those rulemaking processes as well as regulatory processes. Um, that's not exclusive. It doesn't mean that we're only gonna look in those contexts. It means we do continue to commit and enhance the work that we started, especially in 2016, uh, in terms of talking about and engaging on what does this mean in terms of tri tribal treaty rights. I also wanna acknowledge that we are now a signatory on the Sacred Sites MOU, Dorothy mentioned. Uh, these are really important policy documents and MOUs because of those commitments, because of the agency actions that will follow based on these commitments and that understanding of how we need to collaborate and have better relationships with our tribal partners. I wanna also acknowledge that we serve as the co-lead for the Climate Change, Tribal Homelands and Treaties Committee, of, along with many other federal agencies and federal partners. Um, and just recently, EPA conducted consultation on our climate adaptation plans, both headquarters uh, nationally and or regionally. So we have had a number of our tribal partners, especially in our region, who were able to provide some comments and provide some great feedback in terms of some of that climate adaptation plan activity. I want to go just a little bit deeper into how we consult and how we try to engage with our with our tribal partners 
uh, especially when we're looking at issues, maybe like with the Yellowstone issue, where we may not have direct, what I would consider to be primacy or, or direct authority making, there are going to be some components here that EPA would um, advise on that may enact and overall that we would um, consider as part of either rulemaking, uh, larger federal impacts decisions and um, some of those regulatory activities. Uh, well, first of all, before we get into, you know, maybe some of the details, I do want to talk about that um, when EPA offers consultation, how we intend to engage and consult with tribes, uh, we will offer, if we recognize that there may be a tribal interest and in some impact, whether it's on or off reservation, we will reach out and offer that consultation to tribes. Um, again, it's looking at that specific impact, specific activity, uh, where there may be an impact to a tribe, a tribal interest, or in Indian country in general. Um, one question that has come to us is, does EPA consult uh, with tribes if the tribes ask? And that is emphatically yes. Uh, there, there's no restriction that only EPA would engage consultation. So again, in building the partnership, if there's an interest, if there's an area of a tribe that they have a concern that maybe EPA didn't recognize, we are, uh, our doors are open. We are open to that consultation. We wanna understand and have a better uh, commitment and, and, and comprehension of what the potential impacts could be in terms of some of the tribal um, activities and tribal interests. So yes, we absolutely will uh, consult the tribes if the tribes are interested uh, in consulting with us and if they offer to engage. When do, do we participate in state consultations, for example? And, and I wanna point this out, why, do, why are we bringing this up? Um, because there is an entire level of partnership here where when EPA, when we talk about the authorities in, in terms of where we work um, and the primacy authorities we have, we focus on those determinations of Indian country, um, but we don't exclusively operate in Indian country. We work with states, we work with other partners. Uh, we have national standards and regulations that apply in multiple areas. But one of the things that we do try to work on is enhancing those relationships between tribes and states and other jurisdictions when they are um, working to negotiate things that may impact things like water, air, and other, point, and other um, natural resources. Um, one of the things that we do participate in, and, and this is especially in the context where EPA may be approving um, a state water quality uh, standard, for example. <clears throat> the state has an obligation to comment and conduct consultation as well, or I shouldn't say consultation, but they have an obligation to uh, conduct public comment and try to solicit um, comments and such from all of their partners and constituents. That also includes tribes. And so when we see that there's an activity with a state that may be impacting or could potentially impact tribal interests and EPA ultimately has to approve that state action. So a state would submit an application to us for their water quality standards, for example. <clears throat> We would, we want to have tribal and state engagement. We want to encourage that facilitated participation because one of the challenges that we recognized is having last minute, um, you know, reaching out to the tribes. We've heard this time and again, the tribes don't want to be coming in at the 11th hour. We want to have that partnership start when the action begins. And so one of the things that happens is in terms of tribal or state engagement, excuse me, um, we try to help facilitate and share information with tribes that this process is going on. We highly encourage the, the tribes, if they're interested, to participate in that state process because once it comes to EPA for um, an, an action, sometimes those actions are very time limited. And to conduct tribal consultation and really try to inform the tribe or to share what EPA's perspective may be or what those interests are in terms of gaining or gathering meaningful consultation and meaningful interest input from the tribe, it does tend to be, and it looks like that 11th hour consultation. So we're really working to focus on ways to outreach at an earlier um, opportunity. We're looking at those efforts that are happening that may not be right in EPA's control, but that may ultimately come to EPA for decision-making. And we're really trying to encourage that facilitation between between tribes, between states. 
um, providing comments and even conducting consultation if, if states have those consultation policies. So I do wanna emphasize that because in, in a lot of times folks are like, well, this isn't an EPA matter. EPA is not the presiding uh, body at this point. There are a lot of opportunities to continue to engage that we do support. And then we do try to encourage, especially tribal consultation early on. One of the other questions that comes to us is do, do, does EPA consult on matters outside of a reservation boundary um, and, or beyond Indian country? And that, and I would say yes. And especially in those areas where we have approval determinations or decision-making that need to happen, if they're regulatory actions, if they're rulemaking actions, yes, we do have those opportunities to consult. Um, one opportunity and one example would be when we engaged and worked with both the, um, the Confederated Salish and Kootenai Tribe um, in Montana, as well as the Kootenai Tribe of Idaho regarding uh, uh, the Lake Kukanusa area and Kootenai watershed on some Montana water quality selenium criteria. Um, this is a, we knew that this was a big interest point. We recognize that the tribes have off-reservation treaty rights that could be impacted by the water quality um, selenium criteria uh, revisit that the state was doing. So we worked to engage both with the state as well as the tribe to make sure that they had, that the tribe had a voice early on in that process. Um, it effectively went through. Once it got to EPA, then we were able to move quickly and we recognized that everybody was well informed. So the, again, those are, those are, that's an example of an opportunity where we've consulted, um, where treaty rights may have been involved, where they were beyond the exterior boundaries of the reservation, and where EPA took, effectively took an active role. So again, just giving some examples on how we can do those consultations, the efforts that we're trying to bring to the table, and enhancing the work that we do, um, wanted to just share that information with you. I recognize for the interest of time that you know, we do have other partners. I wanna thank you very much and we look forward to any questions that you may have. Thank you. Thank you, Kimberly. Those are very important words for all of us to hear. And you know, we've got a long um, relationship with Kimberly as she was our attorney general for, for quite a while here at Wind River. I also, um, uh, respect her position of working for EPA and the fact that EPA is a very important partner in protecting our environment. Our next speaker is John Murray. He, John Murray is from the Blackfeet Nation. He is a tribal historic preservation officer. And the Blackfeet Nation is another one of the tribes and reservations that are located within the greater Yellowstone ecosystem. So John, if you're ready and available, I'll turn it over to you. You may be, you may be on mute. Okay. Okay, I think I'm on unmute now. Yep, you're, can you hear me? Okay. You're good. Yeah, okay, so I came on yesterday, uh, 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 Wes asked me to take the place of a panelist who had a death in the family. He also asked me for a bio, but, uh, I'm calving right now, and I didn't have time to get around to it. So, uh, but just a uh, a little uh, quick introduction. Uh, I work as a historic preservation officer. Um, I'm a former college teacher. I was once a visiting scholar at University of Oklahoma. I uh, am a former wildland firefighter. I was a hotshot superintendent for a type one hotshot wildfire suppression crew. I served on a national overhead teams as an operations section chief. Also work as an elder for the Blackfeet tribe. And uh, as for the Blackfeet traditional people, <clears throat> been very busy uh, with that uh, because the border is closed. Uh, our, uh, we have three tribes up north and a lot of the elders uh, couldn't get across the line. So I end up uh, the only uh, elder here uh, on the Blackfeet that can do those high ceremonies. So, so I've been uh, like uh, pretty busy for a couple of years. 
But um, I think uh, I'm gonna just quickly talk about um, our connection, Blackfeet connection to Yellowstone. So my grandmother, her name was Kutsterpun, uh, Nochkisa. She was born in 1848 and she died in 1952. Uh, she was 104 years old. And, uh, I was five years old at the time. And she used to tell stories of, basically some of them are recorded too, uh, through that uh, Women's Writers Project in 1938. And so she had talked about uh, uh, families that were used to live in the, around that area. Uh, and some of the, those that I remember are like Caffro, uh, Weasel Fat, Yellowhorn, and then further north was the small robes, which, uh, uh, and so <clears throat> also in the 1851 treaty, uh, the Fort Laramie Treaty, the Blackfeet were not present, but a map was produced of Blackfoot territory, a crude map, uh, and it's been transposed over, uh, roughly transposed onto a Montana, Wyoming map. And it includes all of Yellowstone. Blackfoot Territory, 1851. And so also uh, uh, the uh, Merrill Burlingame was expert witness for uh, uh, claims to Akiti in, in the 1940s and 50s. Uh, he's a professor at uh, Montana State University. <clears throat> and uh, he didn't like the Blackfeet <laughs> as uh, we found out, but, uh, but he did say, uh, that, uh, you know, the Indian ring, which was the treaty council, knew the area around Three Forks and South and, and, what, and North, and all around it was the heart of Blackfoot country. Yet they included in the treaty as common hunting ground. And, and those documents are over in the special collection at Montana State University right now. Uh, but, um, one of the most significant origin stories of the Blackfoot takes place uh, on the Allstone River, just south of uh, south of Livingston, currently Livingston, Montana. So uh, our connection there uh, has been uh, goes back a ways, uh, and then for a consultation, you know, uh, Rosemary Suchek was the uh, archaeologist at, uh, at, at uh, Yellowstone. And she was able to secure some funds several years ago for us to do a low budget traditional land use study. And, uh, and so we had uh, completed that, but uh, the, uh, <clears throat> and, that, and that's on file there at Yellowstone. And, and so, uh, but also traditional land use areas, uh, you know, they, I think when we're talking traditional land use, we need to look at protecting the land. Uh, so you've got like, uh, take for instance, you know, the park services idea of conservation uh, is really a clash with people who claim that they, because they pay taxes that uh, these parks belong to them. Uh, so, you know, I went down to Yellowstone, and, uh, well, several times, but we were down there and, uh, I, you know, I could have just been on, on freeway 105 in Los Angeles, actually. You know? uh, and then, I don't know if it's the culture nowadays, but there's always this woman who's like red on your bumper, trying to make it from point A to point B, you know. So, so we, we left there, I don't know. But the reason I talk about traditional use uh, need to be protected. Uh, uh, and and uh, we, we border Glacier National Park and Canada. And so there are sites and there are areas in, in uh, Glacier Park that have become unresponsive to the ancient ceremonies. And I, and I might just add something here that Blackfoot, Blackfoot people still have their ceremonies 
and languages intact. It's a land-based knowledge and, and land-based language even. But these ancient ceremonies then become unresponsive in Glacier Park. And uh, I guess you could say sterilized. And so uh, we don't know how long. So we adamantly trying to protect the area of uh, the Badger Two Medicine. I've been working on that for a number of years. Uh, my ears perked up when I heard Scott Christensen say that we need to repatriate certain lands, you know. So, <clears throat> you know, the lands that we've lost a lot of lands. Um, and, and, you know, we could just look at television right now and see what Russia is doing to the Ukraine. And, uh, and eventually they'll try to course them into a treaty and appoint a headman or puppet uh, dictator, or, or in our sense, we could call him an Indian agent. So we, we've lost a lot of land and, and we'd need to be thinking about our connection to it. If we, we, have, we have a lot to, we can offer humanity. And I think a lot of potentially, you know, humanity possibly, you know, possibly could have been at a crossroads at one point and gone down the wrong path thousand years uh, <clears throat> because you know when we're looking at the connection to the land in, in our world view uh, you know in consultation uh, we look at uh, the land as a uh, as living the waters as living and and very often I find myself uh, uh, having you know well, I have an undergraduate degree in Western philosophy too, you know. Uh, <clears throat> but a lot of times I find myself trying to articulate or wrestle with the person who may be educated from the University of Georgia with meeting the minimum standards to conduct the principal, be a principal investigator, conduct a study. And so I'm trying to, you know, articulate with her the land-based knowledge uh, and language, uh, and then she wants, and she or her or him would be wanted to recreate it in a Western worldview. And so, consultation to me is a lot of times um, just checking off a box, you know, on a corner that needs on a, on your checklist that needs to be done before you can proceed with your projects. Most of our uh, um, consultation we have with the Park Service uh, is to, uh, you know, comment on, on, a, on a project or something like that. Uh, and so we asked, well, you know, we would like to be involved, you know, uh, and bring some elders and, and really very powerful to bring people on site uh, and, and also a lot of the stories get will come to them. Um, consequently, we're told, well, we don't have money. You know, I get money from National Park Service for the tipple, but it doesn't even cover my salary. So we raise money. We ask, we get people to raise money. I have a, a person working for me. The compliance officer, we have to raise money for her salary. So consultation is, is, sounds really good. You know, we really like to be involved. But, um, we, you know, maybe surprised to you, but we were born with a blank slate just like everybody else. And a lot of our learned knowledge is, is from our, uh, uh, you know, we grew up. We're taught, you know, it's in our bones by the time we're 18 years old. And so a lot of times too, we, we go on site and, and we find things that, uh, that are significant to us. <clears throat> One of the 
Bulletin 38, National Park Service Bulletin 38, and identifying traditional cultural properties. Uh, is mostly focused on criterion D and looking for actual evidence on the ground. Whereas native people, Indian people, indigenous people have areas, uh, vast areas that are sacred to them. Uh, and then, but then, you know, people say, well, you know, sacred, the word sacred site to me um, is like, it's, it's like it's crystallized or it's located. Uh, <clears throat> it's not moving anymore. So people are looking at a culture like it's dead or something. And, uh, you know, it's, but we're an ongoing culture. And, uh, and so there, there are times we want to do things uh, in, in certain areas that are traditional to us, but there's no markings on the ground, no sacred site on the ground. Or not. So, <clears throat> so, you know, I think when we're thinking about those types of things, uh, we need to probably, uh, well, for us, you know, like I say, our language and ceremonies are all intact. And uh, <clears throat> one of the few in, a, in the country, actually, I think from in the world, so, our, you know, our connection to the, like I was saying, water, uh, you know, when we were talking about the rivers that are badger two medicine, and, and, they, and the people older than me, my teachers that have passed on, uh, you know, they're saying those, those waters are living, you know. And, and then we tell the Forest Service, you know, who's, who's responsible for, for carrying out the leases that were uh, in the area oil and gas leases, uh, this won't buy it, you know. And so, <clears throat> so we have to kind of more or less try to do the best we can while consult people doing a consultant recreate our stories and our worldview into a Western document. So here's what we were able to do. We were able to, in the Badger Two Medicine, uh, looking at the, the art, you know, the Charles Russell art that when he was creating art in the bar and selling it for a drink or trading it for a drink, it was folk art. It wasn't until I went through a sale or a dealer that it became art and philosophy of art. So, so thinking along those lines, negotiating with, with the people, uh, with the Forest Service, and the elders would say, well, this guy knows the story about that area. This guy knows, he knows about that. He has connections over his supernatural experience with a grizzly bear there, you know. Uh, <clears throat> and you can't do that. You can't come and drill. So, so when I got involved, what we did was uh, we put those into an ethnography. And, uh, and, and then we had a document that would suffice to stand up in court. And so, so the, I think we need to encourage tribes, especially like the Blackfeet did a low budget, uh, thanks to Rosemary Suchek at the Yellowstone, we did a low budget land use study there. But we also have other areas around there that are, that are significant to us. And, and so this, this idea of setting aside lands for, uh, for the, to allow a worldview that could potentially lend a lot to, to humanity itself and the world and the condition of the world that's in right now by use of the land, which we know is alive. So, but then our connection to the Buffalo, uh, you know, we, we had uh, tried to, uh, at one time we were only allowed to kill two Buffalo at Yellowstone, Blackfeet. It was a law that had a sunset clause in the state of Montana. So we were going to talk about it with the state and, and the law had already vanished in the sunset. So we, so we start trying to get down there to hunt some of the buffalo. And, uh, and so one of the guys brought up the 1855 treaty. And, uh, and then the governor's office got back to us and said, well, you only had 99 years of rights there, uh, and they expired in 1954. 
So maybe, you know, maybe we have more rights. Uh, maybe we need to file a lawsuit or something now because uh, the, the treaties apparently expired. So, so what, we, uh, what we did is we said, well, we have Aboriginal rights. And just look at the treaty, uh, the 1851 treaty, you know, which, which designates that even though we didn't sign it, uh, uh, it, it designates that area as Blackfeet. So, so we have an Aboriginal right to it. And so we were able to get our people down there. Uh, and our, uh, we've been doing a lot of research with the University of Arizona. I've been a TIPO for 19 years. We're doing cumulative research. Uh, and, uh, and so hopefully we, someday we can share a lot of that. So I, I would just like to say that they conclude by saying that the Buffalo will give us everything. And our worldview, uh, you know, the spirituality, you know, everything, clothes, lodging, food. But I also want to point out how important the woman is to our culture. Uh, the women are highly venerated in a traditional way of the black people. Uh, and and we want we're trying to bring that back and trying to get the ladies to hold their head their chin up and, and heal the community uh, <clears throat> through traditional teachings and traditional ceremony and language so with that um, I may have run over my eight minutes thank you thank you John very much for those good words and uh... You know, as with any Zoom event, we have to look at the time schedule. I think we're a little bit behind now. I'll turn it over to Charles. You know, just looking at the chat, there's a lot of good comments and questions. And that's what we wanted to do is be able to get people thinking about Yellowstone and the other areas that we are concerned about. So uh, we're going to take a short break, but I'll turn it over to Charles. Thanks, Wes. And thanks for all the panelists. I also want to thank uh, Superintendent Kim Shawley, uh, who was intended to be a panelist as well. I know he offered some um, powerful words early on. And just as a reminder um, for everybody participating, if you have a question for Cam or any of these panelists, please place those questions into the chat. Um, the first question that I see here comes from Alex with Mountain Time Arts. He writes, how can the tribal affairs branch of EPA impact state environmental policies outside of reservation lands? Specifically, I'm referring to the state of Montana drastically reducing water protections during Montana's last legislative session. Kimberly, would you be in a place to respond to that, please? Yes, I can, I can speak just briefly to this. And one of the things I think that's critical, Alex, thank you for that question. Um, one thing that we do with our tribal affairs branch is we also partner with our state um, counterparts. And when I say that, I know that Montana DQ and the Montana Governor's Office of Tribal Affairs and um, Indian Affairs, that there are some great liaisons for tribes in those offices. And when I say that, we partner with the state, when we recognize the state processes that are going on, while, again, we really do have to be cognizant of EPA authorities when EPA is making a decision, when we have primacy, if a state has a delegated program and responsibilities to set those standards and such, does EPA have a role in ultimately approving or agreeing with those standards in terms of application submissions. Um, but one of the things that we do is we try to help facilitate those conversations, facilitate awareness. The water quality standards selenium criteria revision that I spoke about, that was an effort that I would really like to, I think was a really positive effort. It was well supported by the Montana community. We recognize that there were some political interests after the fact through the Montana legislature um, but ultimately that criteria um, moved forward and was ultimately approved by EPA. Um, that was an effort to help, you know, look at or, and address some of the selenium issues that are coming down from that transboundary coal mining issue um, that's really impacting a lot of the health and the watershed um, health and, and some of those pieces. So when we start talking about how can we collaborate, how can we um, be effective or have those efforts going on, it really is about relationship building and making sure that the communities, not only in Montana, the public communities, but the tribal nations are involved in sharing the information and impacts. 
So that's one of the ways that I think we have been um, able to help make sure that the community is aware and that they're the ones who are driving those comments, uh, not EPA. EPA is not speaking on behalf of the tribes. We just wanna make sure that there is meaningful participation and that there's meaningful engagement. Valerie, while we have you here, it looks like there's another question um, from Faith Spotted Eagle, who's a panelist in our next panel. She writes, does EPA come out to conduct training in light of all the rulemaking and MOUs um, and this, the new developments that are happening within the administration? Uh, I appreciate that effort, um, that question. There is a couple of different things. Number one, we can certainly help to provide additional information to our tribal partners and our tribal communities on some of these efforts and initiatives. Um, some of those pieces are still in development, so we may not have full answers for everybody or how EPA is responding specifically. But for example, with the consultation policy, we are happy to engage with the tribe and the tribal communities to let you know what we are doing in response to both the executive memorandum and how that's gonna impact the consultation policies that we currently have in place. Um, I do wanna mention that we are still under travel restrictions uh, just you know, because of the pandemic, we're working to get some clarification on when we can support some of these community efforts. Um, but if there's a virtual opportunity like this, we're really happy to help reach out, to share, and to help or you know support some of those questions. And um, please get in touch with me. We do work with all of our tribal nations. Uh, we have 24, 25 out of 28 tribal nations in our region who are currently strong tribal partners. They have EPA grants. Um, for example, the uh, Yankton Sioux Tribe, we work with Danny Zephyr and her um, EPA department, and we would be happy to partner with all of you to put on some sort of effort about that training and that information. Thank you. Thank you, Kimberly. Um, and one, one last question before we take a short break here. I think this may be best directed to Superintendent Shali. Um, Janelle, is curious to know if Yellowstone National Park for the 150th anniversary will be celebrating the tradition of mountain men, various um, mountain men who were part of various expeditions to explore and trap throughout the area. Particularly- Yeah, so I, I think what we've, I appreciate that question. I, I think there's so many people that have been involved with Yellowstone from early on before Yellowstone. Uh, we've, we've kind of stayed away from, you know, any, one individual or, or group of individuals necessarily. Um, so we're probably not gonna do a specific thing on John Coulter, um, <clears throat> but a lot of our commemoration activities have um, a lot of the history and a lot of the uh, recognition to not only the, the tribes, uh, obviously pre, pre Yellowstone, but also uh, those that played important roles in the creation of the park. One question I did see earlier, I can't remember who asked it, I saw in the chat about visitation uh, and I know we got to get going here, but <clears throat> I um, it was it was something around how are we going to manage increasing visitation in the future? I think it's a really, really good question. I want people to understand that, you know, we mapped every square foot or every square foot of, of pavement in the park last year. Uh, the park is 2.2 million acres and there are 1750 acres of the 2.2 million acres that are roads, pullouts and parking lots. Um, I do regularly over 200 miles in the backcountry of Yellowstone, and I can tell you firsthand that uh, each year I do that, uh, the, uh, once I get a mile away from the road or less, uh, I think last year in that 208 miles, I counted less than 25 people uh, once I got a mile off the roadway. And so we have a really large problem with visitation in a very, very small percentage of the park. Uh, unfortunately, that small percentage of the park takes up a, an enormous amount of our time, budget, and, and energy. Uh, we're going to continue to look at strategies that make sense. Uh, it's not a one-size-fits-all solution when it comes to managing increasing visitation. What might work at Zion or Rocky Mountain may not work uh, at, at Yellowstone. Uh, we we're looking at other parks that have implemented more aggressive visitation management uh, practices. Uh, we're looking micro geographically in areas in the park where we have major issues. We'll continue to do that. And the biggest thing is that we're not gonna take unilateral action. So any of the converse, any of the solutions that we develop on a small to large scale 
will be done in, in concert with our partners, uh, tribes and others in, in relationship to how we manage visitation in the future. Thanks. Thank you, Cam. At this point, we're just running a little bit behind schedule, but that's okay. This has been incredibly fruitful. I wanna thank Cam and then all of the panelists and the chairman who have spoken so far. Um, we're gonna take a three minute break. So feel free to get up, stretch your legs, grab some water. We'll come back at 11 o'clock Mountain Standard Time. Thank you. All right, welcome back. I'm gonna hand it back to my colleague, Wes Martell to introduce the second panel. The first speaker on our panel for this afternoon or this morning is Valerie Gressing. Valerie is the executive director of the National Tribal Historic Preservation Office. And she is committed to protecting culturally important places that perpetuate native identity, resilience, and cultural endurance through support, guidance, and advocacy of tribal historic preservation officers. She is passionate about advocating for and elevating native interests and voices in protecting and revitalizing native culture and places. Previously, she managed a range of collaborative projects, including characterizing tribal cultural landscapes and a cultural resources toolkit for MPA managers at NOAA. 
While there, she instituted a cultural shift in how her colleagues work with indigenous groups by ensuring that staff and leadership are knowledgeable about principles of sovereignty, self-determination and proactive engagement and relationship building. Valerie holds a BA in history from North Carolina State University, an MA in anthropology from the University of Iowa, uh, and a PhD in coastal resource management from East Carolina University. Um, in the interest of time, um, you know, we went over our time limit this morning, uh, which was great because we heard a lot of good information. Um, we need to get done by 1130, so I'd like to ask all of our speakers, and I hate to limit you, but could you please limit your comments to five minutes? Valerie, it's all yours. I will certainly do my best, but that means that I'll probably have to let a lot of my slides do my talking and uh, I guess maybe take questions at the end. I was prepared for uh, eight or so minutes. Uh, is everyone seeing the slideshow view? Yeah, okay, great. Valerie Grusing, Executive Director of NAFPO, uh, National Association of TIPOs, as Wes mentioned, uh, here in my home office in Silver Spring, Maryland, on the north side of Washington, D.C. This is the ancestral homeland of the Piscataway and the Nacotchtin peoples. Uh, I myself am descended from colonizers, so remain eternally grateful for the opportunity to do this work and to be here with you all um, with such an esteemed um, suite of, of guests here. I'm going to talk about uh, TIPOs, and uh, I guess I can maybe streamline some of that since um, you will be hearing from more and you have already heard so much from Mr. Murray. Uh, briefly, they assume uh, the duties of the State Historic Preservation Officer on tribal and trust land, and that is a function uh, of the National Historic Preservation Act. Um, when a tribe goes through the Park Service application to get that MOA in place with the Secretary of the Interior um, to assume those lists of duties from the SHPO. Um, that is an act of sovereignty and self-determination. It's a little bit of an oxymoron since uh, it's managed by the Park Service, um, but it is what it is in the statute and the regulations. And um, we are in the business of helping tribes to go through that application and to assume those duties as an act of sovereignty and self-determination. Um, to, to manage these things on, on tribal and trust land. They get funding from the Historic Preservation Fund that's appropriated by Congress. Mr. Murray alluded to uh, the small amount that they, they get from that as well. And I will touch on that uh, throughout the course of these slides. Tippos wear many hats, um, of which you see a listing of just a handful of them here. Cultural resources and places. Uh, I don't think I need to explain this to many of you, but this is within the purview of the work that TIPOs do. It's historic properties, the term of art uh, regarding the National Register of Historic Places. Uh, and then it's of course, archeological sites, which many of us uh, in our Western purview tend to think of first. And it's everything else too, because it's all connected. Um, so, I've enjoyed the conversations about co-management here, and I wanted to highlight that we have a new Protecting Native Places Fund uh, that is currently open to NAFPO members, uh, TIPOs who are members of NAFPO, um, which can easily be rectified if they are not. And uh, that is intended to help um, bolster tribal voices and co-management on public land. So that's the purview of that. Um, climate change, we've heard a little bit about that. IHIs is indigenous health indicators. We had our own virtual conference last week and we had an amazing uh, panel on climate change wherein a former TIPO uh, in Oregon uh, talked about some pioneering work that they have been doing uh, regarding indigenous health indicators um, related to cultural resources and land. Traditional knowledge, uh, there's been some interesting a uh, conversation in the chat box and a response that I had attempted to type as well um, that went uh, did not go to the individual who had left the meeting, but that is, it's a valid form of knowing um, and we're, we're in the middle, I think, of an ongoing paradigm shift um, in the federal government and um, in academia and in Western science in general uh, of recognize, recognizing that as, as a valid form of knowing. 
This is a fun um, interactive word cloud exercise we did at our own conference last year. And in response to this question, this was the answer that we got. Funding, funding, funding. <clears throat> uh, this is a complicated graph. I will explain to you quickly. The Historic Preservation Fund, as appropriated by Congress in green here, does go up every year, as does the number of tippers. Out of 574 federally recognized tribes, 208 currently have a Park Service recognized um, THPO. That number goes up every year by about 5 to 10, and so therefore you see the average apportionment that they get for this funding is staying relatively level, and that's the problem. Um, consultation, we always talk about requirements versus best practices. You've heard about some of the requirements here, and there's a lot of guidelines and guidance documents out there that outline best practices in addition to the bare minimum checkbox requirements. And we are strongly in the business of trying to help um, raise awareness of those. Um, it's relationship building. It's, you know, it's some pretty fundamental um, human activities, but um, for a lot of uh, federal agencies, it's not uh, institutionalized or necessarily mandated, which is also some chatter we've seen uh, in the box there. And something that we're trying to work on, right? That's a good photo. Uh, <clears throat> that was when uh, they, these ladies had just been elected to Congress. Timeless though. Um, making meaningful mean something. Consultation is supposed to be meaningful in good faith and um, now according to, to President Biden's memo, uh, robust. Strengthening nation to nation relationships has two parts. Agencies need to do better. Um, agency staff need to be funded and supported to do, uh, to implement the best practices in addition to the requirements. And tribes need the capacity to be able to respond to these consultation requirements. We're worried about um, the project reviews that are going to come from infrastructure, T THPOs, as well as uh, state historic preservation officers are the ones who need to respond to those review requests. And without additional funding, um, they're going to be uh, facing a monumental challenge with the reviews that will come uh, from infrastructure. Dorothy mentioned the White House Council on Native American Affairs. And I would also mention that the Advisory Council on Historic Preservation have um, many, many efforts ongoing, um, which Dorothy also highlighted. And this is my last slide. A seat at the table is the metaphor that we always hear. Um, and I wanted to point out related to meaningful that um, it can mean different things to different folks. And I think that's what we're seeing, have been seeing, um, and hopefully we'll be seeing change with regard to agencies as tribes is, is that meaningful means something different. So that seat at the table has to be at the grown up table uh, and it has to come with both the meal and the utensils uh, so that everyone at that table is able to take advantage of everything that's there. That means identifying which tribes need to be there. Um, where and how, and again, that issue of capacity, uh, which fundamentally is funding and staffing, as John mentioned, uh, the average amount that they get from the Historic Preservation Fund covers almost one whole staff member, and that's not enough. Um, so we're advocating hard to increase that, um, and then also help provide knowledge and tools for um, the range of needs that THPOs have, as well as tri tri tribes trying to establish THPOs. Um, and I encourage agencies to always think about, um, you know, when, when you send a review request or uh, try to engage tribes in there and you don't get a response, then this is, this is largely why. Um, and so in addition to, um, you know, needing to increase the historic preservation fund and needing to support reviews for infrastructure explicitly, please, please think about creative solutions. Um, that you may be able to uh, find in your capacity as agency staff or as nonprofits or, or wherever you are um, to, help, uh, to help THPOs and, and tribes trying to perform these functions um, and, and help meet them where they are so that they can engage in these activities in a robust way. Thank you, Valerie, for a tremendous amount of in information in an awfully short time, and we're sorry for that. Our next presenter is Louise Dixie, and Louise is from the Fort Hall Reservation. She's a member of the Shoshone Magic Tribes, currently employed as a cultural resources director with the Land Wolves and Cultural Resources Department. She has been employed with the department for five years. She worked with the Bureau of Indian Affairs for eight years 
processing feed or trust land acquisition and rights of ways on Indian lands. She was also employed in the tribal gaming operations and a paralegal for the Office of the Tribal Attorneys, among other tribal jobs during her work. Louise earned a Bachelor of Science degree in political science from Idaho State. She is a student of the Vatic and she's rolling language and become, hopes to become a fluent speaker of both languages. She is married and has two adult daughters and five grandchildren. And Louise, I will turn it over to you and thank you for joining us. Thank you, Wes. Yishayo Awawash, Louise Edmar Dixie, Ne Diria, Ne Nania, Cultural Resources Director. My name is Louise Edmond Dixie, and I'm the Cultural Resources Di Director for the Shoshone Bennett Tribes. And I thank Wes and the Greater Yellowstone Coalition for helping to put this together. I'll share my screen now um, and get started. My presentation is, can you see my screen, Wes? Yes. Okay. The Shoshone Bennett Tribe's tribal cultural connections to Yellowstone National Park are very significant. In Bannock, this region is known as Badoroni Wakwami, or water standing in a row. We here at Fort Hall are a number of different family groups or bands who were moved to the Fort Hall Indian Reservation. We utilized huge territories throughout the West and the areas that we utilized were known as Daviwa. There's evidence to suggest that Shoshone and Bannock people made use of the horse as early as 1690 to 1700 in the plains on the Columbia River and the Northern Plains. And the acquisition of the horse allowed our people to extend their range northward in pursuit of game. Perhaps as far as Saskatchewan, the horse allowed changes to land use patterns, allowing for more freedom and range. Pre-reservation lifestyle allowed travel across a huge territory to gather food. And because of that, when people ran across us, there are native terms for all the different populations of our people who they ran across. The Sihiwoki, are those who came from the Boise, Idaho area. Shoho Agaidika being the cottonwood salmon eaters. Bia Agaidika meaning the big salmon eaters. Hohogoi meaning sagebrush people. These bands found in the Fort Hall area. Agaidika meaning salmon eaters are those bands found along the Limhai Salmon River and Pasimaroi Valleys. Dukurika. It means the eaters of the mountain sheep. The main difference is that the Dukurika remained in their isolated villages, largely on the middle fork of the Salmon River, which today is a Frank Church wilderness. Other Dukurika bands were moved from the Yellowstone country to Fort Hall. Yahandika means groundhog eaters, and these bands rolled from Raft River to Spencer, Idaho. Bukondika meaning bah or Sone Bahirika meaning weed eaters, those that lived along Bannockrit to Raft River. But all of these bands were moved to Fort Hall, among others. But there were a total of 11 different treaties that were signed with the leaders of the Bannock and Shoshone people, but only the Fort Bridger Treaty of July 3rd, 1868 was officially ratified by the Senate. The Fort Hall Indian Reservation was created by executive order in 1867 as 1 1.8 million acres. The Fort Bridger Treaty was signed on July 3rd, 1868. The Bannock Reservation mentioned in the Fort Bridger Treaty was declared by executive order to be at Fort Hall. Signatories to the Fort Bridger Treaty, including our relatives that we've heard from earlier, the Eastern Shoshone and Bannock leader Tagi and his headman. Bannock and Shoshone people were described in, in our terms as Wihinakwat, or those who are uh, known on the knife side. These were the Shoshone speakers. The Paiute speakers or Bannocks called themselves Ba'anakwa, meaning on the water side or on the west side. Bannock and Shoshone Teviwa. You know, our, our areas include many, many wide ranging subsistence cycle areas. The ethnically mixed 
buffalo hunting bands of the Upper Snake River, most often identified as Bannocks, developed an event and even wider range of subsistence cycles and made them the wealthiest of the Nua groups. Nua meaning our people. That's what we call ourselves. Osborne Russell remarked in the summer of 1835 that the mixed band he visited had just returned from salmon fishing to feast on fat buffalo. They usually wintered in the Fort Snake River bottoms in the vicinity of Fort Hall. But you know, the, our people traveled um, huge areas. On the bottom left are some camas bulbs and a camas flower that we still harvest on the great camas prairie near Fairfield, Idaho. With the addition of the journey to Montana, the Bannock subsistence cycle reached its greatest extent. The Bannock Trail, once used by Native Americans to access the Buffalo Plains in Idaho, was extensively used from 1840 to 1876, and a lengthy portion of the trail extends through the Tower District from the Black Tail Plateau, closely paralleling or actually covered by the existing road to where it crosses the Yellowstone River at the Bannock Ford, upstream from Terror Creek. The map on the right, as most of you know, was put together by Aubrey Haynes from the Bannock Indian Trail, Yellowstone, the Yellowstone Library and Museum Association in 1964. But the Bannock Trail, as we know through our history, extends from California to Montana with known branches throughout the West. There's been other work that's been done by um, Katie White and others from the National Park Service throughout the years. That all of that research has been to document and identify sites throughout the Bannock Trail in Yellowstone. On the Camas Prairie, we dug roots and prepared for the fall buffalo hunt and helped held a great trade fair. In the late summer and fall, the Bannocks departed for the buffalo hunt. They hunted along the Missouri until the herds diminished where they were forced to travel east. Beginning in the 1840s, the Nua, or our people, utilized the Bannock Trail, which crossed Tagui Pass, today known by non-Indians non as Targi Pass, traversed the Northern Yellowstone Plateau and descended the hunting grounds near Guchunambi, Guchunambihi, which is cow heart or buffalo heart, which is located Northwest of modern Billings, Montana. But the subsistence cycle complete, our people returned to the Snake River bottoms for winter. So our people not only knew the areas throughout Yellowstone, but traveled it annually in order to thrive upon the resources that were found there. Currently, the Shoshonebanic tribes have many co-management efforts that include the tribal members harvest buffalo pursuant to our own treaty, the Fort Bridger Treaty. We develop our own harvest regulations. We have tribal fish and game officers who enforce the regulations often on reservation. The Shoshonebanic tribe came to an agreement with the Park Service in the late 70s that allows tribal members to present their tribal ID to gain passage through Yellowstone National Park. And that was after many years of consultation with the tribe. And the Shoshone Bannock tribes today continue to co-manage bison, grizzly, wolves, and other big game animals of the Yellowstone ecosystem. So I think I met your time frame. Uh, and sure. and sure. I think um, with, I really appreciate the fact that uh, Wes has been talking with us for many months and uh, we appreciate the opportunity to share just the real small bit of our information. Thank you. Thank you, Louise, for, for, those, for those good words. And we really appreciate working with you and looking forward to additional work with the Shoshone Bannock tribes. Our next presenter is Crystal Seabaring. And Crystal is an enrolled member of the Northern Arapaho tribe and currently the director the Deputy Director of the Northern Arapaho Tribal Historic Preservation Office. She earned her bachelor's degree from the University of Wyoming in History, American Indian Studies, and Environment and Natural Resources. And Crystal, you have the floor. Okay, uh, can you hear me? Yeah. Uh, those Niaka and Eta'ena, Nasina, Crystal Seabaring, Nananana, Hinanaena, Natne, Nasithena, Hinanaena, Northern Rapo Tipple, Nananana, Deputy Director, 
Nainan and Nan at Hisse, Thay, Rosalie Sage Lebo, Naysana, Nanan at Nat Nay, Greg Lebo, Nabesi Behet, Nanan at Nanbase, Joe Sage, Nay Behet, Nanan at Hanate, Hazel Trosper Sage, Nyatha Jana, Don Tana. So that's just my introduction um, in a rapo way of saying where I come from um, and my family, um, all my relatives out there. Um, thank you for having me. Um, I'd like to thank Wes and all the panel speakers for speaking uh, before me. Um, and just excuse my elders for me speaking in front of you today. Um, I, I would like to just briefly discuss, you know, just TIPO and what we've I've experienced being in part of the deputy director position for the past three years. Um, I started here in 2017, so I'm really new at all of this and still learning, but I've seen a lot. Um, and as Valerie um, slide showed, um, we deal with everything, um, cultural resources, cultural uh, traditions, language, all of that, you know, and we don't have much funding to cover it all. And so staffing, um, and actually being able to review those, those documents, those projects is a really big task for us um, in our office. Um, I feel like within our Northern Rapo tribe, our TIPO, um, we do have more staff than uh, most TIPOs do. And so we're able to kind of delegate certain areas to uh, other staff members that help us um, stay on track. But a lot of times with the frustrations when I first became, became um, involved in tribal consultation is like they said, you know, coming in at the 11th hour with the surveys already done and they just wanting us to approve them and just to check their box. And at that time I knew that, you know, that was an issue that, you know, not only other tipples have said before me, but it, it was an issue that I wanted to address um, specifically with Yellowstone, um, back in 2019, uh, we got word about uh, uh, many different projects that were happening within Yellowstone National Park. Um, and uh, a representative came to one of our tribal archaeologists and said, are you guys involved in this project that's going on in Yellowstone? Um, we didn't know. We kind of came back to the office to look at the records to see uh, if we did receive any notifications. Um, and we didn't find any, we had hardly anything on Yellowstone National Park, which I thought was disturbing because, you know, we are within the state of Wyoming um, and that we should be consulted on. Um, so our tribal ar archeologists went out and um, start um, getting in contact with the National Yellowstone National Park and kind of saying, you know, what projects do you have going on? Uh, are we going to be informed? Was there any notification sent? And I think through, just like with any tribal government, there's always turnover. Um, there's always changes in leadership. Um, and then also within the National Park Service as well. So I think there was it, a lot of things fell between the cracks. And so um, they were saying, well, we sent out a letter to your leadership. I don't know exactly where they were sent to or who got them. Um, and with with our system here too, you know, there's a lot of things that we miss where uh, a lot of the notifications do go to our tribal leadership, but then they don't come to our office. And so that's just an internal thing too that um, we deal with. And so it's trying to work on those things and make it a more streamlined, um, a process to where it comes to our, our office. And a lot of times, even within our state of Wyoming, within our own tribal programs, um, they don't know the functions of what a THPO does and how we are very important and vital into protecting cultural resources, cultural sacred sites, anything like that, um, especially within the reservation and in our ancestral migratory territories. Um, so I, I feel it's going in a great direction with everything that Biden and uh, Secretary of Interior Deb Hallen have put forth. Um, and in my opinion, it feels 
like we're going to be getting a lot more notifications and reviews and you know it really does come down to funding um if i could staff um <laughs> a, a huge department to tackle every notification and review that comes into our office i would um, i know that's how important it is for our people to to preserve our oral histories our tribal uh, migration stories and all of that and and to put it on the same level as an academic um, review. I really think tra traditional ecological knowledge is right up there. Um, you know, our elders may not have the PhDs that academics have, but in our tribal traditional knowledge, they are our PhDs. They are our elders that have lived the life and, and went through the experiences. And in terms of that, where, yes, I do have a college degree, but in the terms of traditional knowledge, I am just starting out and I am still learning from our elders, from our community, from our people. Um, and another, another great thing to add to that is when we do tribal consultations and we meet with other THPOs from other areas, I get so much uh, information from them that they have about our, our tribe. And so it's, it's just the reciprocity of it all that comes through and um, I learn so much every day. Every day there's something new. And I know that we could be doing more um, in an efficient process if we had more funding available. Um, if agencies were trained and um, not knowledgeable, the new ones that come in on how they need to notify tribes. Because what we found out from 2020 with all of these uh, housing constructions that have happened at Yellowstone National Park, we were never notified. And so we have a lot of reviews that have come through that um, the SHPO, Wyoming SHPO has, has had uh, opportunity to, to comment, but when it came down to tribal consultation, I have not seen anything in there that states that they have had tribal consultation. And what we have assumed is maybe in the past when TIP, our THPO was first starting, uh, they could have said, you know, we weren't interested in that project. And then they took it as we weren't interested in anything to do with Yellowstone, which is not true. Um, and so I just hope that moving forward, we have a better process, uh, more funding to staff so we're able to uh, thoroughly look at these review projects and, and to involve our elders to reconnect uh, these spaces and these places for our youth to learn from, to reconnect. Because I really, with all the you know, negative impacts that happen to our communities, I really believe that connecting to these areas, to our ceremonies, to the plants, to the animals is a great way for uh, us to deal with a lot of trauma that we've had. And so I, I really push for that. I, I would like to see more um, talks happening, more uh, discussions on how we can work together, how we can unite and just uh, find a better way in the future to protect everything for the entire nation. Um, with that, thank you. Thank you, Crystal. Appreciate your work and your comments here this morning. Our final speaker is Faith Spotted Eagle, and I had the honor to meet Faith just a few years ago. She is the corner. She is an elder from the Ehangtamong Band of the Osete Sakawan. She is a coordinator of the Braveheart Society, a traditional Dakota society. As a fluent speaker of her language, she received her cultural education for her grandparents and father. She has an MA in counseling and guidance from the University of South Dakota and has been a school principal, teacher, counselor, manager of numerous projects, organizational trainer, and a peacemaker mediator. She has two children and three grandchildren. She is the only Native American to receive an electoral vote for president for the United States in 2016. She lives on the Yankton Reservation and has defended water all of her life after losing her community to the Fort Randall Dam. She fought and won against the KXL pipeline and has also stood strong against the DAPL by being the chair of the Hawkmon Treaty Committee and the leader of water projects. I'll turn it over to Faith. Greetings, everyone. How long do I have 
with so I can time my my comments. Can you hear me? Five minutes. Five minutes. Okay. Yeah. All right. Um, greetings. I'm Petty Wash Day. Good day. Uh, you pia kid na pet shoes up here. I shake your hand uh, from the bottom of my heart uh, from Ihangtwa Makoche. I think that um, it's pretty tough to do an act in five minutes. So uh, <laughs> I'm sure there'll be other opportunities. And uh, Wes said it all. I've done um, created a lot of spaces, but I think the comments that I want to make today are the importance of the the awareness that um cultural diversity is the same thing as biological diversity i like what somebody earlier said that when you have conservation in order for conservation to happen i think it might have been scott you have to have people to make that happen and so i want to draw attention to that because a lot of this is place-based retrieval of knowledge of our history so as the young lady um that talked previous to me, she talked about the role of TIPOS in retracing those steps and sharing with each camp as they come together in this now federal undertaking of TIPOS, but they did it in the old days when we did the peacemaking and we traveled from community to community and we made peace in people's territory. And I feel like that's what's happening with the Yellowstone event coming together. We once again get to be around the Rappahoes, the Shoshones, the Crow, all of those tribes that sometimes we don't have occasion to be, but it's in the place where we all shared. In our language, we call it Oyanke or Owanka Wasto, which is actually an altar. So an altar is a place where people live and connect to the earth. So the Yellowstone is a Oyanke. And we're pretty excited about being able to return and renew those connections. I think the other thing is that when we, um, it's really important when you talk about traditional ecological knowledge, everybody has a filter that creates uh, an opinion of what that means. But I think from our perspective, it emerges from specific places of the planet. So when you look at Yellowstone, there are specific place-based knowledges that each of the tribes share. Some of it is very similar and some of it is very different. And so this, behooves all of the players, the gatekeepers, the oppressors, the ones who are not quite sure what's going on, to take this opportunity to say, okay, this is an event where we're going to bring our knowledge together, even being on a Zoom like this. Um, I figured I didn't have much time, so I'm not going to do the PowerPoint, and I'm just going to speed talk. But during the course of my life as a 73-year-old elder, I think that there is such rich uh, ecological knowledge that we possess that is really going to make a difference in saving our planet. And we all know that, and now it's suddenly popular for people to say that. But those of us that have been on the long haul, I was 12 years old when I began to fight for the Missouri River and our treaty rights and our inherent rights. I was sitting along the bank, and Wes has heard this story numerous times, but I'm sitting there with my father, and he's looking out at the water where our community was destroyed. And he looked at me and it was almost like in a different space and time. And he said, my girl, you're going to have to do something about this. And I said, I'm only 12 years old. What can I do? And he said, you're going to figure it out. So I figured it out. And we have created, after we came home from Standing Rock, we saw what the colonial forces did because a lot of what we're suffering, even at Yellowstone, is the result of colonial abuse of, of policies that have gone awry that continue to go for the benefit of capitalism. And so we have to reevaluate that and we got to shake out that, that uh, framework and say, who really is this for? Is it for the gatekeepers? Is it truly for the cultural diversity and our relatives, the four-legged, the other uh, animal spirits that live on this land? And the important thing to remember is that we really reflect the role of the buffalo because the buffalo are exactly like us. They live on a reservation. We live on a reservation. When the buffalo leave the reservation, they get shot. We get shot too. And so I think there's some parallels there that are very um, assuredly the same. The, we, our oral history tells us that our DNA is the same as the buffalo, the, the Te'oyake, 
And the matrilineal nature of the buffalo is a real teaching at this time because some of the policies have been made by patriarchal systems. And so as we begin to look at that cultural diversity, if you look at the buffalo, I remember I went to visit a herd in Oklahoma and uh, the herd keeper took me out there. I've been to many of the herds and as an elder to do cultural work and recovery from historical trauma. And we go out to the buffalo herd and he said, look, they're going to start moving. And he said, look, there she goes. And one of the big uh, female buffalo started up the hill and it was like grandma said, let's get out of here. And so they all turned around, they flipped their tails and they followed grandma up the hill and then they moved to a different space. And another place, they are so extremely intelligent. I remember my dad used to tell me, he said, when you look in the eyes of an animal, you're looking at the, the face of creation. And so when I went to another herd in uh, Nambe Pueblo in the Southwest, and he told me, he said, these buffalo, this buffalo dance that we do came from you people. And some of those buffalo dances came from the area that you that we're talking about. And he said, <clears throat> talk to them. And so I went up to the fence and this, um, this grandma buffalo came up to me. She kind of sniffed me and then she checked me out. She scanned my whole body. And then she looked the other way and she kind of whiffed. And then I sang a song to her and she turned around. She acknowledged me and then she walked off and the rest of the herd followed her. So we're looking at deep cultural ecological knowledge that still exists. Another story that I want to tell you, because uh, I could tell you stories all day long. So Wes, you're going to have to cut me off. But I think there is knowledge in the plants. I would love to do an ethnobotanical survey of the park in regard to the traditional medicines that we have, because there are probably some plants there that are in existence that are no longer in our the areas that we are. But that's and maybe they never were because that's why we traveled there. My father said that when a uh, person, a young man or a young woman got to about the age of 17, 19, they went on Ozuya and they went on a hunt to get salt. They went to the coast to get shells, dentalium. They went to the Gulf to retrieve those things and they may not have returned because they could have got killed by their journey. But the Ozuya journey made them greater than they were before they went on the journey. And by doing that, they were able to bring uh, the knowledge back to our people. And so you're at a location where a lot of our people went Ozuya and passed through those lands. And some of them stayed, uh, some uh, like we signed treaties, our 1851 treaty goes into Yellowstone. And so um, we had, I can't remember which girl it was, there was a lady that talked about the role of historical trauma. Whenever we organize these things around the National Park Service, it's also a grieving ritual because those were our lands. And so now it's for recreation for people to come in with their RVs and people to get their pants stolen from Buffalo, like in Custer State Park, when they get too close to the Buffalo. Um, and I think that if you have somewhere in the doings, we have to realize and confront, not confront, but understand the healing that has to occur when we return to these places because they were taken from us. And so it's not all happy go look lucky. Oh, good, I'm going to help you with your management plans. It's um, we met with the core. We're doing a cultural bioregion which reaches into the Yellowstone area, and that's why I'm excited about working with the group that Wes is it with because we're going all the way up to the headwaters of the Missouri. And um, when the core came to us, they said, "Why don't you give us your TEK?" I said, "Why would I do that?" And they said, oh, we're going to put it in our management plans. I said, you're crazy. Why would I do that? Those are our management plans. You don't know how to translate them. You have no worldview to understand what TEK comes from my perspective. So those are the interfaces I think that I'm excited about in listening to all of you in saying what you pledge to. Because when you talked on this Zoom, I see it as a pledge. I see it as a commitment. And so if we're going to bring those worldviews together, we can't just make it a Zoom talk, we have to figure out what does that mean when we translate it to those place-based uh, sacred places. I know there's been an MOU that has been signed on the sacred sites and that makes my heart happy. Uh, I'm not sure how that's gonna play out, but we have to be vigilant that they just are not words. And so um, I'm looking forward to uh, 
the work that is coming out of this 150 year uh, anniversary, but at the same time being vigilant as we always are when we walk into these spaces because a lot of times people when they host these things will center themselves. And so we have to figure out because we grow up in, a, in America that is a hierarchy. And so in our learning, we have to make that into a circle. So I truly hope this work will be creating, and I know it will be, I trust that will be with Mark, um, Wes involved. Um, just a few brief words about what we're doing over here. We're trying to decolonize uh, from colonial constraints that have really um, held us down. When I, we left Standing Rock five years ago, uh, I realized that because of captivity, a lot of our people did not know what was on the Missouri River. We did 150, 200 years ago, we knew everything. And so when we came home, we thought we are going to remember, locate, survey, map, identify, share every relative species, plants, animals, water on the Missouri River in a 150 mile stretch. And we're gonna know it like the back of our hand and we're gonna manage it. We're gonna co-steward it with the Corps of Engineers. And that's what we're doing. We're also doing it with a lake that flooded our community and almost destroyed our community. And that's uh, in the process of being negotiated at this point. So I was pretty excited to hear um, relative Dorothy talking about what is happening internally with the Biden administration, because those are the type of spaces that we need to truly um, heal and develop what is good for not only the country, but for the earth. I will, um, I'm sure that I've already talked for five minutes, it feels like 10, but I will make one last statement. And I think it's important because I'm very interested in the plants and I'd like to get involved in that of what is remaining at Yellowstone along with the buffalo. But I wanna make two comments. One, um, I think it's important to acknowledge the spirits that exist in, in the plants that live on the land. It took me 73 years to talk to corn. We are raising corn that is 600 year old seed that was passed from the Mandan people on the river to my people, the Ihangtwa. And we've had it within our family system for 300 years. And so last summer I was out weeding the garden and my son called and I have a whole crew of gardeners in Braveheart Society. We till gardens and we're doing a lot of food sovereignty. But my son called me and he said, you know, he said, there's a big storm coming. There's hail, wind, might even be a tornado coming and you need to do something. I said, I don't know what I'm going to do with the garden. I said, I can't save it. It's too big. And he said, well, I know you have your ways. And I said, thanks for letting me know. Not sure what I could do. And I was in the midst of the garden. So I talked to the corn. And I said, my babies, my relatives, there's danger coming. And um, you need to do what you need to do to protect yourself. I'm not sure what that is, but the storm is coming. And so maybe we could ask it to avoid it, avoid us, but that's up to nature. But I just want you to let you know that I'm worried. And so I was pulling the corner and all of a sudden I heard something to the left of me and it was kind of like a vibration. And I, I'm allergic to bees. And so I thought, oh my God, it's a bee. So I turned and there was nothing. And so I start pulling the weeds again, talking to the corn, and then I heard the vibration and I turned and this little corn was going like this. It was vibrating. And I looked at it and it, it acknowledged me because it kept going. And I thought, oh my gosh, it took me 73 years to be able to talk to the corn. I was so nervous and excited that I called my aunt who was 90 years old on the standing rock. And I told her, I said, Toyin, I finally talked to the corn took me 73 years. And she said, well, of course, to, uh, Tojan, that's why we had corn songs. Now you need to make a song for the corn. And so it was very natural for her, but that's like a paramount thing that took me 73 years to acknowledge. And maybe some of you will never do that. Maybe some of you will, but they talked back and that one was real loud and clear. And guess what? The storm went around us. The storm split and they, they were able to save themselves. Um, the other thing that I want to mention is that some of these fights that we're on in with the environment, we don't get paid for it. We just do it because we know it's necessary for life. Um, so we are going to meet with the assistant secretary of the army this afternoon. My son and I are leaving from Standing Rock. So Standing Rock is not over. 
and they have put the EIS on hold. So Washington stepped in and the Assistant Secretary of the Army is meeting with us, the tribes tomorrow. So say a little prayer for all the plants that are, would be affected, all the four-legged, especially the water. Water is our first medicine. And I, that's the other thing that I'm worried about in Yellowstone is the water. So as you can see, I have a list of about 100 things. And <laughs> so my PowerPoint would be too, way too long for five minutes. But um, my intent was not to amuse you, but to get you to listen. So I hope I have accomplished that if there's any questions. How was that, Wes, or any questions? Faith, I hate to have to chop you off. I could listen to you all day. And I want all of you to know that I've been working with Faith and in her bioregion work and the protection work that she's doing. And Faith, you and your elders have given me good energy and good strong spirit. So I thank you guys. For, thank you. Yeah, for, and for, I just want to, uh, Wes, I want to say one more thing. Know, uh, I'll come back to visit you here very shortly. Okay, Wes, can I add one more? We're nearing the final stages of our event here, and I just can't tell you how gratified and encouraged I am by all of you that attended and all of our speakers. And I wish we could have, we could do this for days and learn so much. And I'm just really appreciative of all of you. Thank each and every one of you for being here. I really got to give a special thanks to Charles Drimmel and Christy Weber from our GYC team. If it wasn't for them, we wouldn't be sitting here enjoying all of this good discussion right now. So all of my GYC team, thank you. GYC board, thank you. I want to turn it over now to one of my, to our Indian ways. One of my brothers here is a keeper of the Northern Arapaho pipe. And we're going to ask him to offer us a prayer here to finish off our morning activities and we'll have some room for some remarks and questions when, when my brother is so, Nelson, I'll turn it over to you. Hey. Oh, wish you asking me to, to pray. Uh, this morning when I when the sun came up, uh, I prayed. I prayed for this uh, get together that we're doing here today so that everything will turn out good for, for Yellowstone and the tribe. And then I just went. I want to say hello and pray, to, pray some more. And as soon as we hear the thunder, we're going to, we're going to switch the sacred pipe. After that, then we'll, we'll have that uh, pipe fast. Come um, down the line. We're going to get lost pools. We set up our rabbit lodge and to the big lodge. So what we're doing, well, we'll continue to pray, pray in those uh, ceremonies to so everything will turn out good for, for all of us. So again, I say, Ahu. Hey, nothing but uh, nature, me, hey, nah, me, not good age, and this is man, hey, nature. Not 
Thanks, Wes. I don't see any questions in the chat, but I'm sure there are many stirring right now and probably lots of ideas um, amongst all of you. This has been an incredibly rich and fruitful morning. Thank you um, for your time. Thank you to all the speakers and panelists for your time to participate and, and contribute to this uh, conversation. And really, this is only the beginning um, you know, I think I heard Wes maybe say that this is, you know, we wish we had more time. Unfortunately, we, we will have more time to get into a lot more detail on all of these topics that were brought up today. And that will be at the June 1st through 3rd intertribal gathering on the Wind River Reservation. Uh, my colleague, Christy Weber has put the registration link into the chat. Um, we encourage you all to register if you're interested in and have the means to participate in person uh, on the Wind River Reservation. The, a couple of questions came up earlier. Uh, this this um, event today has been recorded and um, if whether or not you're able to participate in all of it, you will receive a link to the recording and we encourage you to share that link with other people you think might be interested in hearing the content of today's um, conversation. Again, I just want to thank everybody, um, encourage you to register for the intertribal gathering and a special thanks to the Eastern Shoshone and Northern Arapaho tribes who are our host for today's event, as well as for the intertribal gathering in person coming June. We look forward to seeing all of you soon. Have a wonderful day. Thank you. Everybody, have a good day. Be with us. Great. We appreciate you. Oh.